Sure thing. All right. Uh, so hi, everyone. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. It's good afternoon for um, for Cleo and I here in, in Fredericton. Um, so my name is Robert Harris. I'm the Geomatics Manager uh, with New Brunswick 911 inside the province's Department um, of Justice and Public Safety. Uh, and I'm joined by uh, one of my Geomatics analysts, Cleo Marshnikius. And uh, uh, we're really excited to present on, on this topic today. And um, we're what we're talking about is using um, GIS for effective uh, public information reporting um, and a little bit of information on um, our province's COVID-19 dashboard. And uh, I'm going to flip over to uh, that screen and, uh, and we'll get going. So we're really excited to um, to talk about this today, a lot of the work that we do to support the province, um, especially when there's provincial security or emergency events, tends to stay um, internal or behind the firewall. Um, so we don't get to show off and talk about a lot of the stuff that we do. So we're really excited that we can do this with you guys today. Um, so first, I'm going to walk through a little bit of, of our COVID response here in New Brunswick. Um, our initial activation for for this um, for the pandemic was in January 2020. Um, we started taking a closer look at things that were happening um, kind of around the world and in, in small pockets in the United States. And our full activation, uh, which basically means everyone responding and working on it, started on March 12th of 2020, uh, which for some still feels like last week. Um, but uh, it was much uh, further back than that. And currently today, we are on day 560. Um, this has been our largest and our longest event in the province's history um, for anything emergency response. Um, it even led to a government shutdown on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. Um, basically, they sent us all home with our laptops um, and, uh, and that was that. Um, we were responding to the event and helping out our emergency uh, partners. Uh, and then when, in around April timeframe, we got tapped on the shoulder by our province's COVID, COVID cabinet um, to talk about things that we could do to kind of get some information and data out to the public um, on the province's COVID response. And we launched our public dashboard on June 29th, 2020. It's been going every day since. Um, just to give you an idea of, of how much usage it's getting, um, some of the feature services we have in this online dashboard, specifically our Health Zones feature service, which um, people can click on and get information about um, case information in their uh, public health zone. Uh, since we went live, that service has gotten over 444 million. So we're, we're, we're marching steadily towards half a billion requests um, for that. Usually gets around a million a day. Um, on a calm day, if there's a day where there's lots going on, or if there's a lockdown or something like that happening in a zone, um, then our usage will creep up to about the 3 million hits a day um, mark, which is pretty good for a province of, um, you know, with only three quarters of a, of a billion folks or of a million folks. So one of the early things that we had um, was our internal, we call it our, our COP, our common operating picture. And this is a little dashboard that we built for our emergency partners and planners, um, just with some basic COVID information around cases in uh, one of in our seven health zones. Um, and you can see on the right, just some, uh, we had how many cases, how many are active, recovered, um, that kind of thing, and a little bit of an epidemiology chart on the bottom. Uh, one of the other things we track up on the top right there is how long our event has been um, going on for. So um, you can see some of that information up there. Um, and what's feeding this is a concept of operations that we have, which is called geo operations. And, and what geo operations is, is it's the use of GIS tools and data to aid in emergency management. Um, it's been the evolution of GIS professionals um, on my team into frontline emergency operators during emergency events. Um, so they're kind of GIS first responders um, in these events. And really integrating um, those GIS and spatial analysis skills that, that GIS professionals have into all phases of emergency management. Uh, we've got a good history of this in New Brunswick. We've got over 10 years. 
um, of supporting security and emergency events. Uh, and we've done everything from, you can see it there, ice storms, floods, hurricanes, civil unrest. Uh, we have a nuclear plant that we practice on every couple of years. Um, uh, you name it, we've done it. Although pandemic, this was a first for us. Um, we do a lot to support this. We provide maps, spatial analysis, situational awareness, anything that our emergency managers need to create that, that full picture um, so that they can respond appropriately. Um, and we are also fully integrated into uh, the Provincial Emergency Action Committee. So they are the group of folks that provide the all of government response. Um, there's representative from every department of government um, inside our emergency operations center um, to help manage any emergency that happens. Um, typically, a lot of the events that we have, um, especially in New Brunswick, are around um, or have an element of um, electricity or, or power outages. Uh, that tends to be our, our, our biggest um, issue, especially in things around high wind events, um, ice storms, hurricanes, etc. Um, so this is an example of an operations dashboard that we have. Um, that basically there's a few things on it. Uh, it's showing all of our emergency operations centers, our provincial level emergency operations centers. Uh, there's the main one here in Fredericton and we have some regional ones in each of our 12 um, emergency response zones. Um, so you can see them on the map and they color code different um, colors based on what level of activation they're on, whether they're um, level one, which is enhanced monitoring right up to level three, which is, which is uh, full activation. Um, so really what geo operations, or we call it geo ops for short, is, is it's a system of systems. It involves a whole lot of training. So everyone on the team is, is, is formally trained in emergency management, incident command, how to work in an emergency operations center, um, and et cetera. We are fully prepared. Uh, we all have laptop go bags, so we are fully mobile and deployable for remote work. This came in handy really quick back in last March when government shut down, everybody was sent home. Uh, we were basically able to go home, plug in and keep going without missing a single beat. So that was really, really helpful for us. Um, and of course, there's lots of uh, standard operating procedures around you know, what kind of maps we make, how we do our handoffs, scheduling, um, making sure after events we do after action reports so that if something didn't quite go the way we wanted it, um, we can kind of analyze that a little bit more to make sure it goes better in the future. Um, and it should go without saying, it, there's a whole lot of collaboration to make this thing work. Um, just for COVID, uh, we um, on nearly a daily basis liaise with our Provincial Emergency Action Committee, uh, with MB Power, uh, with Ambulance New Brunswick, with several government departments, whether that's Executive Council, Department of Health, Public Health, uh, Regional Health Authorities, uh, you name it, we are collaborating and liaising with them, um, as well with other branches within our own department. Um, so the inspection enforcement folks, when we had um, folks working our borders, um, our COVID core, so that's the core government um, COVID folks, our emergency management team, our provincial security advisory team, uh, working with all of these folks on, on near daily basis. Um, one of the things we found useful um, in setting up our, our, our dashboards and, and procedures is being able to leverage external data. Um, so all of the data, especially the data that you know folks um, like yourselves may be familiar, familiar with, with um, open data, uh, if we can find it, we will scrape it, we will grab it, and we will display it. Um, so this is just an example of uh, us scraping MB Powers. Um, power outage data, we find this to be super useful uh, in emergency events um, that we can see kind of a, a near live picture of, um, of outages in the province and, and figuring out where we need to, to move folks and move resources around. Uh, we have things like our critical infrastructure in there. Um, so, you know, knowing where power outage is is helpful, but if you know what's in that power outage and, and if it's something that uh, is essential to, uh, you know, health and safety, um, you know, that's kind of makes it even more important to, to re-energize those folks and get them back online. Um, and with the background kind of out of the way, I'm going to pass the reins over to, to Cleo um, and she'll kind of walk you through some more of the nitty gritty around our COVID dashboard. 
Great, thank you, Robert. Um, so here we have a couple images of our public dashboard. Uh, we went through many iterations, uh, color schemes, while collaborating with our COVID communications team. Uh, one element that we're particularly proud of here in New Brunswick is that both our desktop and mobile versions are available in French and English. And uh, to accomplish this, we decided to build multiple dashboards within ArcGIS Online and wrap them in Experience Builder, which can automatically adjust the dashboard depending on the device that's being used to view it. Um, and you can go to that website there on the screen and you can see what information is currently available. And uh, as always, we expect to make changes in the coming weeks as our uh, COVID situation changes. And then here you get a little glimpse into our project file. So one major difficulty that we encountered while developing the dashboard was coordinating our updates with the communications team. And after a few discussions with the team at Esri, uh, we confirmed that our process of overwriting our online layers and tables would be best. And while we had really great intentions of automating this process, it hasn't been easy or possible to completely standardize the many reports we receive every single day um, to update all 14 services. Um, so we weren't able to do that. But until recently, we, were, we had a team member uh, working seven days a week to gather the information and coordinate with communications to push the update at the appropriate time. And now we only update Monday through Friday or as needed on weekends and holidays, which we're kind of grateful for. <laughs> uh, so to prevent errors and keep our team accountable, um, we created a spreadsheet for our data entry. Uh, to keep it as simple as possible, we enter all the data in the order it's listed in each report that we receive. And on a separate tab, all our data and calculations are automatically populated to match the attribute tables of our layers as well as several, several uh, reports that we send out to executives every single day. Um, and one of the biggest advantages of this spreadsheet is that we are easily able to adapt to new requirements. We assist the epidemiology team with data requests quite often. And as well, we respond to a lot of media, re media requests. Um, and it's been a very valuable tool for all the departments that are involved in the pandemic response. Um, so the public is able to access all the data, spatial and tabular, which uh, we publish freely on ArcGIS.com. There, anyone can use the free tools to create their own maps or apps, or they can use the REST service to consume the data for their own products. Uh, this is typically how other websites connect to our data sets, and it also allows them to set up refresh intervals uh, so our updated data can be reflected in their products as well. So another huge undertaking came into play with the recovery phases. Uh, right now, New Brunswick uh, is in, the, we can move between the green and lockdown phases of recovery. Previously, we had yellow, orange, red, and lockdown. Uh, but what you can see here is our community boundaries do not align with the larger health zone boundaries. Uh, so collaborating with the epidemiology team and with the advice of several other departments and municipal officials, we were able to assign each community to a health zone. Uh, and any time a new mandatory order was issued, we would provide a full list of communities affected by any change in recovery phase. So the next few slides are examples of products that we use to deliver to the executive teams every single week. Uh, this first example shows the weekly total of border entries at our interprovincial borders. Uh, the entries are categorized by commercial or personal travel, and we also create a similar figure to represent entries along the international border. And this map uh, displays some regular travel that occurs between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Uh, here we've used the forward sortation area, the first three characters of the postal code to represent the place of origin and destination. Uh, the inset map at the top shows the most frequent FSA combinations. And in this instance, the travel patterns are actually as expected by the epidemiology team. And this last map is a figure that helps to paint a picture of movement within health zones. So the percentages represent a change in individuals' movement from one week to the next by aggregating cell phone data. And here you can see there was reduced movement in health zone seven, while all the other health zones had increased movement. 
Uh, and now that we're in the green phase, the emphasis was really on vaccine information. One of our goals was to simplify the design so that it would be easier to digest the data that was most important. And with the expiration of the mandatory emergency order in the province, um, we no longer were collecting travel information from everyone crossing the border, nor were they doing any compliance checks anymore to ensure that the order was being enforced. So as such, those data elements were removed from the dashboard, and we expect to continue to evolve the dashboard as needed until we reach the end of this pandemic. <laughs> um, and I'll pass it back to Robert. Perfect. Thanks, Cleo. Um, so a little bit of summary um, on kind of what we did um, is, is really the key to this was leveraging data and spatial analysis um, to help geovisualize, you know, all the pandemic related information, um, both for the public um, and the senior decision makers within government. Um, it keeps everyone up to date, everyone up to date at the same time, everyone's looking at the same picture um, and everyone has the same information. Um, in addition to that, it's been a huge 560 day uh, proof of concept for our geo operations team. Um, we are, you know, not to say that, that no one makes mistakes, but it's been a really good 560 day proof of concept. Um, but uh, we will all look forward to the, to the end and, uh, and kind of going back to our normal day to day. And the other thing that, that you know, pretty much everything is a map. So all of this data that we're collecting uh, in, in response to the pandemic, it all relates back to to a map, uh, which is why it was it was it was really important for the our GIS folks to be able to to grab it and, and make some magic with it. And I think that's yep, yeah, that's our last slide. So uh, I'll switch my screen back here so that if there are any questions or um, anything else, uh, we can uh, go back to that. And I see, so there's there's a few things in the chat box. So there's one question about um, how to use the smartphone data, what kind of data. So um, there's a company called HERE, H-E-R-E, that basically takes and aggregates cell phone data and movement. Um, it does a lot of value add things. Um, it's, it's the service that kind of, if you've ever used the traffic feature in Google Maps, it, it, it kind of helps feed into that. Um, so the federal government was was consuming all of this information and basically providing health zone level um, movement patterns, and that's what we were taking. Um, so we can't see any individual person's cell phone movement, and 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 no one's looking um, and giving reports on what any one person is doing. But it's aggregating um, those kind of traffic pattern trends up to that health zone level. Um, so that uh, we can basically say, okay, if everyone's supposed to be locked down, is everyone kind of staying nearby or are people, you know, out and about and moving? Um, and for the most part, it's, that's what it was, was folks were, uh, were staying home. You could see, you know, if it was a lockdown the next week, they were all had uh, negative movement. And once they opened back up again, they all had positive movement. So um, some of the best practices for being emergency ready um, so I had a little blurb about it in one of the slides, but basically, um, you know, having everybody trained and everybody fully deployable and, and, and remote ready, uh, was, was huge for us. Um, you know, it didn't matter if we had to go from the office to the house, to the emergency operations center or, uh, or whatever we could do it. Um, even some of us found ourselves in situations where we had to do some emergency travel. Uh, and there were days that we've updated this dashboard from, BC, Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, uh, and I think we've we've published in more provinces than we haven't, to be honest. Um, I can answer this next one um, about preserving uh, the other the older versions of the dashboard. So yeah, so essentially everything that we ever did had to get approved by the communications team. Um, so I have dozens and dozens of test versions of <laughs> dashboard that are private um, and I've saved those uh, as well so yeah and, and sometimes we look back at the screenshots of our first of our first one that we were so proud of before it ever went public and we we kind of laugh at those sometimes yeah it's kind of it, it as the pandemic has evolved so has uh, you know the dashboard and what we're, what we display out so it uh, uh, 
you know, the dashboard of today is, is a lot smoother, a lot cleaner, a lot, uh, a lot, you know, better than, than the other ones. See, are there any more, if there are any more questions, we'll give folks a minute to, to pop some questions in. There might be a little delay. So Cleo, do you want to take a stab at the uh, open data? Right. So we did use um, some open data. So I would have to say like the some of the stuff we definitely incorporated into um, what we provided to Executive Council was uh, open data. A lot of the data we receive is not uh, for public consumption. Uh, so we had to keep it quite private. Um, and so there is an element of... No, yes, and no, I guess is that the best response, Robert. Um, we we provided a lot of information and data to the public. Um, a lot of what we initially get is uh, confidential. Yeah, we we you know we have a lot that that feeds into our our you know our, our geo operations machine every day. Um, but you know, with like Cleo mentioned, with the spreadsheets and, and massaging of data. Um, you know, we massage out all of the personal stuff and share out the rest so that people can 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 get a good picture of what's happening. Um, so I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. So I think we have time for a couple more questions. If anybody has any uh, anything. And if not, we like those thank you ones too. Those are always much appreciated. <laughs> there are always times um, while while I'm waiting for some questions to come in, we'll we'll I'll add a little little story time. Um, so one of the downfalls um, by not having it automated is sometimes when our mandatory orders would change and 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 different zones would have to lock down or or, or what have you um, is all of those changes are timed legally to happen at midnight uh, with the mandatory order um, so there we will let you in on a secret that there's no magic happening to make all of our dashboards change at midnight um, it's typically one of us who has drawn the short straw um, and stays up to midnight um, so they can push out new information and uh, also I'll add to that though, we, our team uh, grew throughout the pandemic to help us support uh, this response. So while it was typically whoever was scheduled to, to be on, had to do the midnight update, uh, Robert and I were probably still uh, awake at 12.01, refreshing to make sure everything went smoothly. It's been a long pandemic. <laughs> I think we're all as excited as, as, as everyone else to, uh to shut the as, as fun as this was it, it'll be nice to shut the machine off at the end definitely <laughs> what is vacation <laughs> <laughs> we we all we all hope so too although we yeah. um as things kind of calm down a little bit this summer um, a few of us were able to sneak out for a little bit of a little bit of time off, so uh, we did get a little bit this summer. So that was that was very much appreciated. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll give another minute, and then if there's there's no one else, then I'll uh, then we'll sign off and let everybody continue on to the next session. Perfect. All right. Well, I guess that uh, that's it for us. Um, on behalf of, of Cleo and myself, we thanks everyone for, for coming and, and paying attention and listening today. Um, we hope you had fun. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, and if you need to contact us, um, our information is on the screen. 
uh, we're happy to talk, happy to happy to brag and share and all those other things. So I um, hope everybody has a great afternoon and enjoys the rest of the of the conference. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.